So I'm so pleased to introduce environmental advocate and sustainability partner, Paul Newman. Uh, I first met Paul while working to become a more sustainable restaurant years ago. The work that he and his team are doing to improve the environment and our industry is nothing short of inspiring. Today, we're gonna to unpack practical, no-nonsense ways that you can make more and save more by becoming environmentally conscious as a restaurant owner and operator. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Kopel. I'm a mission-rated restaurateur, and I've spent the last two years talking about running restaurants instead of running them. And I've done it with one goal in mind, and it's to figure out if there's a guaranteed recipe for success in our industry. I host Full Comp, a podcast that airs twice weekly, unpacking the tools, tactics, and strategies of our industry's greatest leaders. It's a selfish endeavor. I have the privilege of talking to the folks I idolize, and I only ask the questions that I want to ask. But the town hall is your turn. Today, Paul answers the questions that you've asked, and I encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions throughout our conversation. If there's anything you want to dig deeper on, let me know. We're also leaving time for live Q&A at the end of the town hall. With that being said, welcome, Paul, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Thanks, Josh. Great to be with you and um, looking forward to this conversation. Well, you know, I, I want to start high level with you. If you could share with me uh, what when you describe to people what you do for a living, what do you say? So it's always uh, an interesting question because you really do sometimes have to pivot this towards who you're talking to because we do a lot of things so um i work on uh i have a couple of different hats that i wear and they're fit you know visually you can see i like a hat but i do have a lot of different hats you can see a photo of me with a different hat there but um so i i i work on running a network for private sector, so businesses, UN, civil society groups, so like NGOs, nonprofits, that kind of groups around sustainable development goals, which um, are essentially, if you've never heard of the sustainable development goals, they're the plan that the UN and every country in the world signed on to in 2015 to address some of the biggest issues that we face. And they're a plan that has these 17 goals and then it has a range of different targets under them like all good business plans or goals, which then go into how you go about achieving it. And we look after goal two, which is um, tag zero hunger, but it's it's more than just about a hunger alleviation. It also in talks about biodiversity, it talks about um, nutrition, it talks about agricultural livelihoods, it talks about climate. And so within that, we run a network, we have a lot of conversations, probably similar to you, Josh, um, what you do with restaurants, where we're talking about how do we, what are the issues, what are the reports, what's the data saying, how do we go about that? And then as part of that, because we're talking about food, we thought it's really, really important to bring chefs into the conversation because chefs connect what goes on at the farm with what goes on uh, on the plate. And so in that sense, we kept created the Chef's Manifesto um, in 2017, which has grown to a network of chefs across 90 countries. And we help in that space coach chefs, restaurateurs that are involved in that to, to think about sustainability, to think about how they're speaking out, to use their voice in different global forums, local forums, national forums, to be able to talk more about how to kind of accelerate and drive forward change. Well, in, in working with restaurants and in the hospitality industry specifically, especially with chefs, especially with the high profile chefs you work with, it's like a cheat code, right? Because chefs and restaurants inform culture in massive ways, right? Yeah, no, I mean, re chefs and restaurants really do inform culture. And when you think about food, and this is something I think, you know, outside the food industry people haven't realized as much is that people are quite obsessed with food food is connected to our culture it's connected to how we live it's it, there's so many elements and and you know often a, a really good friend of mine often when you say how many different you know food critics are there in the world he says there's like almost eight eight, eight billion because every single person is their own food critic they've grown up in a place in a space eating different ingredients put together in different ways. And so when you come to food, food is something that we all think about. And so we're often thinking about whether, no matter how many meals a day you have, if it's one big one or 
17 different smaller ones as you graze through your, 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 your day, you're thinking about food and you're thinking about what do you like and food then brings emotional connection. So sometimes you, there's, you, you're not feeling great. So you want to eat foods that make you feel better, you know, and we've all had that over the last two years, the need for those kind of comfort foods. At other times it's you're on a mission to, you know, you want food to do something for you. So looking to people that understand how to put together ingredients in, in, in not only um, tasty ways, but also ways that can be good for your body, that can be good for your mind, is really critical. And this is where the you know chefs come in. And so that's why we watch so much on TV. That's why we engage with chefs and 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 food in this way. Um, I I also want to talk about the the chefs manifesto on a granular level because I I, I think that it is it is an amazing document. It is an amazing strategy. Can you unpack high level? exactly what it is for the folks listening yeah so the chef's manifesto is a chef-led project that really brings together um you know a, a thousand plus chefs from around the world that are exploring how they can deliver a sustainable food system you know as i said chefs bridge this gap between farm and fork and so it makes them incredibly important food actors in the food system and this manifesto is basically to empower them with this framework tied to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And it's got simple, six, uh, it's got eight simple practical actions that chefs can take under these kind of thematic areas. And this ranges from protecting biodiversity to supporting livelihoods to ensuring access to accessible, affordable food that's nutritious. So there's these kind of areas in which then chefs can get engaged in, but within those areas, there's also then practical actions people can take. Um, it also connects chefs around the world who face the similar challenges and creates a space for them to learn and experience. So like yesterday, we had chefs from five continents talking about how to work with farmers and talking about what are the kind of policy environments and what are farmers looking for and how do you um, support farmer networks in your local community, which suffered greatly under the pandemic. Um, and so how do you build that, that, that up? And so it's also a, a resource um, network. So we have a podcast, which has chef to chef conversations. We have experts coming into that. We have articles on the website, you know, a book recommendation section, you know, different things as well as events around the world. You know, for, for the folks that are listening, if, if you've consumed any of the content that I've created, um, I'm sure you're well aware of one thing, if nothing else, which is I have an agenda. And, you know, I, I've known Paul for years now. And, and during our journey to creating a greener restaurant, a more sustainable restaurant, I wasn't the guy standing at the front of the line saying, I want to do this. It's going to be amazing. I was wrought with the same fear that every restaurant owner and operator has, which is, is it going to hurt? Is it, is it going to obliterate the way we do business today? How expensive is it going to be? Are, are our patrons going to understand what's going on? And so yeah. throughout the rest of this conversation, we're going to get really granular and really actionable because I think it's so important that you see that becoming a, a greener restaurant, becoming more environmentally responsible is something that can save you money. It can make you money. And ultimately at the end of the day, it does pay dividends, especially for the younger generations that are now beginning to dine with us that are interested in environmentally conscious businesses. And with that being said, we'll roll right into the next question, uh, which is, can I become a greener operation without raising prices? This is an interesting question. And I think it really depends on the type of restaurant that you're in um, and the style. And, and I, I think for some people, it's going to be a transition. It's not going to be a, just a, uh, a quick change. We all know food prices are going up. Um, you know, this is something that's happening globally in an unprecedented way. And so if your prices aren't going up on supplies, then you're somehow someone's subsidizing something and they will go up. You know, um, we've, I was talking the other day with a group in the, coming out of um, Dubai and they were talking at, the, at the, one of the largest food, food events and they were saying that people are starting to rethink recipes 
um, on, in, on key products that they're manufacturing to try and avoid certain things because they're saying sunflower oil is going to get too expensive. Um, even wheat, people are starting to think about what are the replacements, what are the alternatives if supply chain becomes an issue. So, you know, this is something just, you know, uh, that we do need to think about around price. And I think that's just a, con a starting point because sometimes prices go up and then you go, oh, that was the sustainability stuff. Well, you know, the reality is there's a big food market out there and that's becoming increasingly challenging. That being said, let's, let's just think about it. You know, plant forward menus generally have a lower ingredient cost. And, you know, most of science says that a plant forward menu is better for the planet. But in that case, staff costs go up. So you've got like these challenges where your ingredients might go down, but your staff cost goes up because, but, and so how do you manage that? And that's something to think through. I was talking to a restaurateur um, who was talking about the fact that they they use a focus a lot on using whole ingredients, you know, nose to tail. They think about plant-based ingredients using the whole ingredients. And so they were able to get their kind of percentages down. And so they were getting their ingredients percentage like really low, you know, talking 10, 15 percent. Um, and, and, and yet their staff costs went up to like 40%. So they ballooned in their staff area, but then they reduced on their ingredients, but their overall um, output was, was good. So, you know, there's these kinds of things that you have to play with in terms of levers. A friend of mine who runs a restaurant in inner city London, she talks about, you know, for me to marinate a steak, turn it over is actually reasonably easy. Um, for me to do a cauliflower and make it into a steak that can sell at the same level on the menu is quite complex and it's actually involves a higher level of skill. And, and, and that's not the way chefs are trained, staff are trained, that's not the way people think. But she said you, you do it and you offer both and then the transition starts to happen. People start coming to you because of what you're offering and that diversity. Because you think about families, you think about a family, they'll have people that have all different types of eating styles. And so they want diversity in the menu. They want food choices. You're very likely to get somebody in the coming few years that's plant forward or vegetarian on in a family group. And so thinking it's not just one dish on the side of the menu that can be you know, plant forward, you need to start thinking about a quarter of your menu or you need to start thinking it as that kind of grouping starts to come. And that's, a pro that's being moved by price. It's being moved by health. It's being moved by climate. So there's like almost three fronts there. Um, the other thing is like, you know, if you use whole ingredients, you reduce wastage, thus you improve profit. And lots of people think about this. This is the way chefing was done in the, in the past. Like when I talk to chefs, they say, you, if you wasted stuff, if you threw anything out, you are throwing out profit. So like if you taste, take the fillet off a fish and then you throw the fish out, you've basically thrown away the profit because the fillet just pays for the fish. And so, the, you know, restaurateurs need to be thinking and working with their chefs to use their skills to use all of the ingredients, to think about how that ties into stocks, how that works in there, because that's actually where you make your profit. Um, I also think it's promoting biodiversity on the menu. So I think, you know, we've for a long time got comfortable with certain ingredients um, and, and people sometimes get scared about changing that up a bit on their menu because they're worried what will people will people know what that ingredient is people are really interested in food and they're interested in alternatives they're interested in new things and everyone's walking around with like one of these in their hands so they can actually they've got an encyclopedia to do research with so if they've not heard of it they can actually look it up pretty fast and go oh that's cool that's from south america and that, you know, helps you do X. So, you know, getting, getting you know, a, a shift from core commodities into, you know, new alternatives. You know, I've got a friend who's got a company and he, he, he promotes Funio. And Funio, um, he's, he runs this company called Yoleti Foods. And Funio is an ancient grain. It's, it's really good for you. It's really good for the environment. And it's super easy to cook. Um, and it's like a, it's a millet. So it kind of, it's, it's like a grain that you could have with a salad. You could have it on the side, but he does all kinds of cool stuff with this. And then when you start talking to people, they go, Funio, what's that? Where's that from? What's it taste like? And all of a sudden there's interest and intrigue. 
And so building this into your menu makes a lot of sense. The other things I would just say is like, obviously um, thinking about seasonality, this is really hard in restaurants because it means change. And once you nail something, you tend to want to stick to it, but changing up things based on the seasons uh, will mean that you're getting things at the right time. And so thinking about that, you're going to get maximum flavor, you're going to get maximum impact into your dishes. And it will also help you, you know, in terms of price. When you're buying something out of season, then it's been stored or it's been managed to be there for you. And so you're paying a premium on it. And so if you can get into that space, um, others, this is not, not able to be done for everyone, but, you know, connecting straight to the farmer, missing out the middleman, losing some of those long value chains can help you save costs. It feels expensive to start with, but it can also help you work that out because you can then start to do things like the seasonality, the, the diversity. And so people are able to do that in different ways, but it's not for everyone. Like not everyone has those relationships. Some people have that multi-site, but I have seen it done. So um, at, at scale. I also want to bring up two points. So I would assume that they kind of in the back of every restaurateur's mind that's listening to you, they're saying, well, is this going to make me go out of business, right? Like, is this, is making such a significant change, even over a period of time, going, going to obliterate my business? And then I, I look to your life experience, which is what compelled me to move forward with this as well as you haven't walked in front of or behind, you've walked alongside thousands of restaurateurs. Yeah as they've made this transition. And so not only does it make these restaurants better and more efficient, um, but there's also this hive mind that you represent through the chef's manifesto, that if a restaurateur is interested in doing this, there are hundreds, if not thousands of chefs that have already walked this path that are happy to help people through it, right? Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, the reality is, any change takes time and there's people that embrace it and they want to run with it and they love the idea of change. And then there's others that, you know, need help to walk through that. And, and for them, I would say, pick one or two things and get going on that. Um, then there's, you know, to me, this is, it's about having a story to tell. It's about doing the right thing. And I think as you continue to do, bring those kind of things together where you're doing the right thing and then you're trying to tell that story. As you said, most people come in, they want to, they just want good food that's convenient and, and, and at a right price point. Increasingly, they're also thinking about their own health, particularly with the pandemic. So people are saying, I need to be healthy. I need to eat things that make me good. They need to taste great still, but they also need to be, you know, help make me healthy. Um, and I think sometimes when we talk about this space, we talk about climate only. We don't talk about health as well. And I think we need to think about health and climate, you know, so it's like what's good for the planet and also what's good for people. And so I think in thinking about that in, this, in the brand that you have, the story that you have, you can really turn that. And I've seen so many restaurants do that in different ways. But, you know, there are restaurants out there that say we want to be a sustainable restaurant. And there's other restaurants that say we just want to be a really great restaurant that's local or we want to be a really seasonal restaurant or we want to be a restaurant that's plant forward or we want to be a restaurant that does that works really importantly on livelihoods for our staff and for our farmers so you know pick a, a niche a story that you can work into and then be credible in that space by developing it i think it's great advice um when it when it comes to vendors which was the next question we got how do you find vendors that, that can help you with your sustainable practice? I, I know that they, there's no universal answer there, but are, are there resources online or, or regionally, nationally, locally that people can look to to find those, those local purveyors in their areas? Yeah, I mean, there's, there is different things, and this depends on the, the, the state, the country, the city that you're in. So, you know, increasingly, I mean, the easiest way is to build some relationships with some other chefs. They might not want to give it away, but they also tend to have, there's like WhatsApp groups and things where they're like, yeah, I'll help you out. Talk to this guy, you know, because what happens is these farms and these vendors, basically they rely on a certain level of scale. 
And so if you find it as a chef or a restaurateur, you want to work with them, you can't generally take everything that they can do. So you need a few friends to gather and link arms. So I think, you know, that, 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 that practical kind of starting point is, you know, okay, like how do we do that? But then you, you've got organizations. So in the seafood space, there's a ton of different groups and you need to do the research into them and just like look at them. I, I don't tend to say this is the only group you should work with because there's so many pros and cons with everything, you know, and it depends on the, you know, the time of the year and what you're working on. And I can't have all that information on everyone globally. So I tend to just say, these are the questions you should ask. You should look into what they're doing, have a conversation with some other partners to see, is that credible? Look at a bit, you know, is it based on, on science or how are they being checked and measured so that you can kind of work that out. Um, on the, you know, there's a lot on traceability that's happening at the moment, and that's increasingly coming on all ingredients. And so seafood was kind of an early lead, but you're starting to see that on other other foods as well. Definitely in the in the beef industry, um, on the high level commodities, vanillas and cocoa, coffee, all these kinds of things. There's yeah. certifications now that are happening, and so what they do is they give you some level of peace of mind. It never gives you the same as if you know the farmer or you know, you know, that thing. Some of my chefs, you know, that have thought about this, like there's one in Ireland which um, has done this so well at scale. Like, so he runs cafes as well as he runs a catering company, which does universities, pharmaceuticals, government departments. So like they do millions of meals. But each of his spaces, he came up with his model of trying to source within 40 miles of the venue. Now, as a catering company, that goes against everything you do because you build recipes and you roll them out across all venues. He, he goes, no, I hire chefs and then the chefs I roll out across venues and then they go and sort out this. Now he said like I needed wheat and I'm, I'm going around Ireland and there's wheat growing in the fields, but I can't buy Irish wheat. I can only buy wheat from other places. And that's because Guinness bought it all. Um, and there's a whole story there that we could go into another time. But Guinness Sport buys up all the wheat on mass. And so, you know, he's like, okay, let's look at, let's talk to some of these farmers about how do I get access to these resources and what does that look like? And now he's got Irish wheat and he's able to serve it in these restaurants, which goes with his ethos and his, his, his approach. So how you do that, I think there's a little bit of detective that you've got to do, which is like getting to know your suppliers. Um, there is these kinds of certification programs that are, I think are helpful and they give you a, a bit of peace of mind. Um, but it, it really does depend on where you are, Josh, as you know. What are some low cost things I can do to run a greener restaurant? Uh, this was actually, this was not the question that I asked, but this was definitely the question that I asked about three years ago when we started this process together. What's the cheapest way to get started? So, I mean, it's small, it's small, it's small practices. So it's like reusing things, um, recycling more, using more fresh produce, um, re which reduces the electricity in large fridges, you know, thinking differently about the way you order. Um, I think one of the biggest practices that we don't think about is reducing portion size. So, you know, we all want to have massive portions, but you can do that in different ways. So like offer half portions, um, make them slightly more than half, but make, a, make it a menu feature. And then people can choose whether they want the massive plate or they want a smaller plate. Um, you know, offer, you know, everyone tends to offer these take-home boxes and things, but these kinds of things target like food waste. They target, you know, um, throwing a lot of stuff. The other, the other thing is, um, you know, adapt your menu according to the produce available rather than the other way around. Now, that would only work in certain types of restaurants. But, you know, I've got lots of friends now that have got restaurants with no menu. And they basically say, you tell us what your allergies are. I'm the chef. I'll cook you some really great stuff. And they're, they're like, one of the guys in London, in the UK, he just won best restaurant in the UK. And he's doing that. I mean, he's a young guy, under 30, Michelin star, amazing spot. And 
you know, he, he goes, I, I just decided I'm going to stop offering people choice in the restaurant and I'm just going to cook really good food. And, and he's able to do that. Now, you can't do that on the side of a road in a fast casual. It's not going to work. Um, so you need to think about what, you, what are the things that you can do. Um, I think, you know, it's also, um, you know, I heard the other day somebody say, talking about, you know, waste. And they said, you know, waste is about laziness. So if it's easier to throw it away, then, you know, you just do. Whereas if you make it harder to throw things away, either through, you know, the extreme is get rid of your waste bins. The other is move them to a location that, where the chef has to walk further. You know, there's simple things that you can do to make that kind of stuff. There's also, and, and where, where, you know, it's Earth Day today, there's, a, there's like one example is, is a good friend of ours, um, Anthony Minette, who's from Zero Food Print. And he basically worked with um, food businesses and their customers to help farmers turn bad carbon into good carbon. And so he's basically worked on this whole carbon farming space, with, which is tied to regenerative farming. And it basically puts tons of carbon out of the atmosphere back in the soil. And so they work with food businesses and they have a program where you can add a few cents per meal to help farmers implement carbon farming projects through grants and stuff like that. But that's a simple thing where you can just go, I'm going to add a program, I'm going to outsource slightly some of this and I'm going to get something on my menu. So that might be more achievable, you know, in terms of it's a low cost to you because you're not paying for it. Your, your customers are paying for it. But, you know, you've got to do that in the right way, introduce and tell that story in the right way so that people don't reject that. But um, it's, uh, there's ways in which you can do that that, that I think are helpful. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that what Anthony is doing over at Zero Food Print is amazing. Um, so that program is, if you go to zerofoodprint.org, um, you can check it out. It, it's donating 1% of every check you pull at the restaurant. Um, to them so that they can work on these sustainable farming practices, which are pulling a ton of carbon out of the air. Um, how do we educate our customers? This is, you, you've talked about it broadly a couple of times now, um, but how do we educate our customers about the importance of being environmentally friendly? At the end of the day, it's going to cost more. Either it's going to cost us more or preferably it costs our customers more. So for those that don't care or don't care enough to pay more, how yeah. have your chefs been able to move the needle? So they pick a few simple ideas and examples to focus on. So they don't try and do everything. So you just pick, pick a few things. You need to, um, I think one thing that we often forget about is training our team about what's going on. And so I think, you know, getting your team really understanding what, why you're doing it and, 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 and how that impacts. And they can then, they're your front line talking to your customers, you know. So if they don't get it, and I've seen restaurants where you walk in and the, the, the front of staff, house staff do not have any idea what's going on. Chefs, amazing, sustainable, front of house staff are like completely undermining everything that goes on out the back. And so you need to make sure the team understand that. Um, I think, you know, I think educating customers, it's also about, you know, giving them choices. I went to a, a fast casual place the other day in, in, in Melbourne where I am and they, they came out and they said, what, what straw would you like, plastic or paper? And, and, and it's a simple thing, but by giving me the choice, it puts it back on me to think about what should I do? Now, some people will feel guilty and they'll go, oh, I should take paper. Others will go, oh, no, I should. But what it does is it actually creates these choices which you then have to make. And the customer is then thinking about, well, why should I do one or the other? I've heard this. So I think sometimes that's really key. I've also seen like um, giving feedback on impact. So, you know, a friend of mine, Tom Honey, he has a restaurant called Poco. Um, and, and, and he's re in the restaurant they have on the back wall, all of the farmers' names that they work with. So they say your eggs came from here, your thing. Now, simple idea. They do it in chalk. And so it's kind of quite, you know, um, rough, but it feels real because it's like, it doesn't feel like it's just been painted on and then forgotten because it changes, you know, like sometimes the suppliers change. But what that does is that, you know, as, a, as an eater, you sit down, you're looking around, you're like, oh, okay, 
oh, food comes from a farm. Oh, surprise. And then you're like, okay, this is really interesting. And so it helps you then kind of connect to that locality and to that space. Um, and so I think, you know, to me, you know, you've got to pick a few ideas, really train your team, um, get, allow some choices, and then really give this feedback um, to your customers in the right way. And that can be done on the menu. It can be done on around the building. It can be done in, in all kinds of different ways. It can be done sometimes on packaging in a very clever way. Um, but it's, I think, really important to, to, to kind of give that way to educate people um, some of those choices. I, I, my favorite is thinking about, how, you know, half serves as well. Like it just reduces the amount of food we eat. And I think if we reduce the amount of food we eat, it's going to be more sustainable and it can still be good for business. I couldn't agree with you more. You, you know, it, it pro and proper, we ended up raising prices by 26% throughout the course of 2019, which is a lot for a restaurant that was already expensive to begin with. And yeah. Chef Sammy and I went back and forth time and time again. How do we tell the story? How do we explain what yeah. we're doing here? Because it was about more than just sustainable food practices. We were offering subsidized health care, 401ks with matching. Like we really wanted to become not just the business, but like the, a company that people would want to work for and that had the ability to be sustainable over a number of years. Um, and, and what we figured out, and, and you made mention of it, is the menu. The menu was our tool. So on yeah. one side of the menu, at the bottom, we listed every local farmer we used. We talked yeah. about our sustainable practices. And on the other side, at the bottom of the menu, we listed every cook, every chef, every dishwasher that was involved by name in the production of that meal that night. And yeah. the reason being, I think people need to see process. And then they need to see people. They need to understand that this isn't just a product on a plate. This is the, the combined efforts of, of weeks worth of work, right? Yeah. By dozens of people in exactly. order to get you what you have. And when you do that, and when you explain it in that way, when you were talking about talking points, you know, the staff had maybe a one minute and 30 second, maybe a two minute spiel that they would say, you know, our commitment to you within the restaurant is this. But this is yeah. our commitment to our community. And in doing that, you know, what, what were people going to say? Well, I don't want to pay the extra $3 for this meal yeah. to make sure that you're benefiting me and the place that I live and the people that work here. Exactly. So I, it, it's <clears throat> a lot of it comes down to cleaning up the story so that it's really concise and effective. Um, but I also agree. It's also about emboldening your team to tell that story with confidence. Exactly. I mean, when you get a when you get a staff member come to your table and they they know what they're talking about with the ingredients and they can say, yeah, you know, we use this and the chef like uses the whole vegetable for this reason. People are like, they're getting information with their meal. It's not now. Not everyone wants it. Not everyone. Every sure. context works. But when you get that, you're like, if you're a particularly, you know, a little bit more on the higher end, you're, you know, people are interested in that. They want to know where that comes from so that they can then tell that story as well. Because you've got to think everything's being shared as well. On the whole, people are not just eating your food. They're also sharing it with their friends, their family. They're telling stories about it. They're looking for experiences. And so in, in doing so, that's how you build your brand. In, in its layers, right? Like it's storytelling, it's marketing, it, it, it's giving people something that when they leave the restaurant, it's something to talk about more than food. You know, Sammy had a sustainable microgreen farm in the middle of the dining room. You know, yeah. how amazing it was for people to see that and talk about it and take photos next to it. Yeah. Um, no, one, absolutely. Of the big, one of the big pandemic evolutions that we saw um, was that, you know, takeout and delivery is a much bigger percentage of what we do for a living yeah. now. And obviously, there, there's there's a sustainable way to do it, a green way to do it. And there's a way yeah. um, to do it where it's a bit more damaging to the environment. Can you talk about what you and the chefs that you work with have done to try and make takeout and delivery a more sustainable operation? Yeah, I mean, this is a really challenging one because you've got food safety issues that you have to deal with. And and like, I mean, I know I talked with with Chef Sammy about, you know, plastic usage in California, you know, and, sure. and how it went up over uh, the pandemic. And, you know, single use plastic, we were really doing, you know, well on that pre-pandemic. And now all of a sudden it was like, 
whoa, okay, we have to go all the way back, you know. And I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, there's there's a few few things here. There's a lot of innovation around packaging going on, like crazy amounts of innovation. Um, I've got I've got a friend who's who's you know commercializing a you know using food waste from restaurants to turn into packaging, you know, and that's it, better than plastic, you know, and it's it's safer and everything. Like so, there's this kind of innovation space going on, and so I would say one of the things in your you know thinking about that depending on your scale is is what are some of those innovative things that are coming through. There's also a kind of return to the past with like. You know, I've, we've seen in London and places like that where people have had, you know, Tiffin tins, which is like these metal tins, you know, starting to be utilised where you kind of buy them and they become part of the experience. Um, and so people utilising these kinds of, you know, multi-use um, offers um, and, and that kind of stuff. I've also seen um, a real shift also in, in looking at health in some of the takeaway, uh, takeout and delivery operations. And so when you think about sustainability, we don't often think bring in the health element, but in thinking about what do you subsidize? I mean, you, even the big guys, you know, like a McDonald's in this part of the world, I, I know it's different in the States, but in Australia, you know, the offerings that they now have around their menu, the choices that they give around salads and, and, and you know, instead of getting fries, getting this and all of these things, these are all examples of trying to make a, you know, takeaway delivery option more sustainable. Um, I think portion sizes is a big one. Again, I, I keep going on about that. And I think this is the big challenge because there's a concept of value that we have around getting more. And, and, and yet, once we get to a certain point, there's a, there's a question of actually having less that's better is actually more. But, you know, in takeaway delivery, that can be can be challenging to deliver and give that same experience. Um, I think there's a, you know, talking to some of the guys that did a lot of the COVID. So in our part of the world, we had, a, you know, hotel quarantine. And so you had people locked up. And then you also had school meal programs that where you're trying to send like a meal back to kids who are at home. And the catering guys that did a lot of this, they're like, how do you make it look good in a takeaway delivery like how do you make food attractive how do you do that and there's tons of innovation that was done where they switched out different things they change use like behavioral techniques like you you make something more red and it tastes more sweet and so you can reduce sugar content you know like there's some really clever things that you can do and if you've got that scale to do um, some of that testing you can then move that around and you can improve the quality you can improve what you're offering into your um, processes. So I think, you know, to me, that's where I've kind of seen um, things really come together. Do customers already care about sustainability? I, I mean, it, it's it, it's, a, it's a big question, I, I think, from, from a, a marketing perspective. And, and how do you connect with customers that do? If this is a choice that you make as a restaurateur, is there market demand? And if so, where is that market? Yeah, it's a good, it's a major question. And it's a, it's a question that, you know, you, you know, in the sustainability world, people are often like, yeah, we just need people to do this because everyone, and you go, you, you got to remind people to say, hey, a restaurant's a business, okay? It's a business, okay? So you don't just do this for common good. You know, it's not, it's got to be profitable. We've got to think about that in terms of like, you don't go and ask a restaurateur to just change to become completely sustainable and then their business fall over. And so sure. when you think about customers, I think, you know, customers is a damn big word and it's a, there's a lot of them and there's a lot of diversity there. So, you know, there are customers that do care about sustainability. There's customers that probably wouldn't even know what the word means. Um, so, you know, we've got everything in, every, in between. I, I think, as you said, you know, early on, you know, chefs are rock stars. They're role models for so many. Um, they're also entertainment stars as well. And so the more that they start talking about sustainability, which you're starting to see um, a lot more in terms of shows and, and the way that people are engaging. So they're thinking about that. They're thinking about livelihoods. I think COVID helped um, in, in, in many ways to really show some of the invisible elements of the, the food space 
system, like why it, why and where it, it has problems. And that I think also made people much more aware about sustainability because they felt all of a sudden, wow, this, this thing that I expected was always going to be there is not there. And, and so now we need to think about how do we protect it? Because once you lose something, you can then... So I think there's a lot of people that were impacted by that and they, they now are thinking differently about the sustainability of it. And so they've got different views of that. Their education's maybe limited, but they are thinking about it. And they do think, yeah, we should be doing more. I think there's things like Blue Planet, which came out with David Attenborough, which you know instantly did amazing things around plastic, for example, you know, in terms of getting people to understand the, the complexity of waste in our world and how that's touching nature. And so some of these things accelerated really fast, these conversations where people are all of a sudden like innovating government, you know, businesses starting to say, how do we change? What do we do? And I think all of that creates kind of a, a way for people to, to, to kind of start to think about it. Um, I think, you know, there is, um, in terms of connecting with customers that do, I think, you know, there's particular demographics in particular cities in particular spaces which are starting to do that. But you can, you can change the message. So if you're in a rural community thinking about, you know, localised farming, you know, people are really, what people are worried about is losing, you know, people to the cities. And so it's about how do we support local business? How do we support this? The message is different to in the city, which it's like, oh, you know, we need to think about the farm. We need, they might maybe thinking more about the environment and things like this because they don't have it right there, but they don't understand exactly. So, you know, pivoting those messages and helping to do that. Um, I also think we sometimes overcomplicate this. So it gets so confusing. It's like, I need to do what, you know, and so th th there's too many choices. So I think we need to also think about our like simple actions and messages and, and, and choices where you can kind of help people make that shift. And that helps them. You don't even talk about sustainability. So like in a lot of the research that was done around helping people to eat more plant forward foods, they say never talk about vegan or vegetarian, you know, just create a dish and make it amazing and just happens to be also vegan and vegetarian. Whereas what people tend to do is go, I've got a menu, I need to create a vegan option. And so then they make it and try and sell it on that vegan option rather than create a really cool dish that's actually really good for people. And so it's like, how do you, how do, you do that? Do you know what I mean? Like I was at a restaurant in New York um, recently and you know amazing um, amazing uh, animal proteins and then th the guy brought out a bowl of beans and it was what he'd cooked for the staff and I'm like dude put this on the friggin menu like it is insane like it was just insane but he's like oh yeah you know we've got like all the steaks and the burger and the blah 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 and and I'm like yeah but this is like seriously good you know but he, his idea or his view was just really struggled with the idea of that could be on the menu. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you, so there's some of this stuff where people are just wanting really good food now. And so it's like, how do you, how do you give that to them as well and make it uh, sustainable? And that then educates them. So it's like, you know, get them eating it and then they go, Hey, what's this? And where did it come from? And what? Oh, and oh, by the way, it's actually full of antioxidants and it's great for you. And then people are like, really? And then they become your fans. So then they tell their friends about it. And then they're like, did you know that, you know, this, that? It? So I think there's ways to do that. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, you know, what we found was, is that, you know, everybody cares about different things, but everybody also cares about the same thing, which is themselves. So, <laughs> right. So That's if true. we, if you're able to, to look at the person you're talking to, figure out what matters to them and speak directly to them and their needs, um, then it works. And, and, I, and I think a sustainable menu can do that based on whether people prioritize uh, eating healthy, right? Whether it's about sustainability in terms of both uh, sourcing or preparation or the process that it took to get it to the table, uh, portion size, all of that. I, I think those are all tools in the uh, in the uh, <clears throat> box to to create impact with the people we're trying to sell on this. Um, food waste we talked about um, donation of food, 
Where are you on that? What, what do you know about that nationally, internationally? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 is, it is a challenge depending on, you know, the rules. And I think, you know, in the US, there's been a recent uh, law go through, I think, that actually enabled that the donation to happen. So there was an act, the Emerson Act, isn't it? I think it was called. Uh, do you know about that? I don't. Okay, I'm pretty sure there was a, an act that's been either going through or or going coming called the Emerson Act, which has been a bit of advocacy around, which allows for food donations. Um, I know that in 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 other parts of the world, trying to get that liability um, issue around food donation is is really critical. Um, in our part of the world, where I am now in Australia, there's there's a there's a group Oz Harvest which got really good at doing this, and they're basically now using lots of different ways to collect food. Um, and so they're collecting, you know, meals, but they're also collecting um, a lot of produce and everything. And then they've even set up a supermarket where you pay what you can. There's all kinds of different models there. Um, I think, you know, when it comes down to, to food waste, it, 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 is, it is challenging. You're seeing lots of restaurants that responded to the pandemic as well that are now continuing on those programs. And so, you know, everything from Eleven Madison, which, you know, set up a program during the pandemic and it's still continuing to feed, I think, 500 people a night. Um, and, and so they're utilising what's coming out of the kitchen that's not going on to you know, um, the plates in the restaurant in, in, uh, to, to do this kind of food um, program. So there are these kinds of programs out there um, that are kind of still happening. Um, food banks are, you know, a good starting point as well to have a conversation with, um, but it, it really does depend on where you are. Um, there's also, you know, continuous, you know, growth in things like World Central Kitchen and, you know, you guys would be very familiar with, you know, Jose and the team and Nate and, but, you know, where restaurants are getting involved directly in helping to prepare meals alongside their own and then distributing through these kinds of networks. And that's happening in response to, you know, fires in the West to war in, Ukraine, you know, like, so it's kind of at every kind of level of scale, often at the humanitarian end. Um, and so, I mean, but I think when we come to waste, you know, the biggest question and the biggest thing that we need to start to shift is how do we not basically create it in the first place? So if you don't have waste, that's where you've got to think, you know, then you don't have to worry about how do you deal with it. Um, and I think part of it is we've, we've built a bit of an industry on thinking about how do we deal with it rather than also thinking about, well, why do we have it in the first place? And how do we just not get more creative in, in, in the way we use whole vegetables and the way we use nose to tail and the way that we're, you know, thinking about and conceiving of our menus? You know, I was talking to a chef the other day and he just said, I don't offer cuts of meat, I offer types of meat. And then you trust me to kind of take the whole animal and give you a really good feed. Um, and just like creative things, but they, they shift people's thinking. And then you kind of have to trust the, the, the chef. It doesn't work in every space, you know, like a fast casual, that's not going to work. You can't go into a Chick-fil-A and say, give me a bit of chicken, you know. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. fair. Um What's involved in composting? And, and is it possible to do it in, in restaurants in multiple tiers of dining? Yeah, I mean, so I've seen, I mean, composting is a very simple thing in many ways. Um, what depends on the scale that you get to, but you can do it. I've seen people just doing it at restaurants, you know, finding a little bit of land out the back and kind of setting up a three bin system or something. And so where you kind of rotate your compost through. It, it, you need to think about the legal environment that you're in. Is there a city rules? Is there elements? You know, I was talking to people in Miami and they're saying, you know, because it floods often, you don't want to be composting in a particular way or it, it ends up all over the front of your restaurant, you know. Um, but you, you, you need to think about it. So I think it's location dependent. Um, if you're in a city, there's lots of services which can take uh, waste and turn it to compost. And I think, you know, I know, know in London, a number of restaurants were working with a company that would take the food waste and, and turn it into compost and then grow vegetables for the restaurants and take it back. And so as a restaurant, you could actually buy up a, a plot, 
that you could grow in your own waste your own vegetables and they then brought you back the vegetables so they came picked up the waste they then brought you back vegetables and there was this like program going and it was insane like you're thinking about that kind of circularity so you know it, it there are those kinds of bigger spaces where you you know in an inner city london there's no way you could do that new york or um la but they, then if you've got you know out in the suburbs or out in a space there is you can also then get things like biodigesters there's all different technologies as well to help you in your composting and so there's a lot of, it just depends how committed you are to that but i've seen restaurants which have have radically reduced their wastage by doing that and then also improve soil quality and then had gardens like there's a lot of restaurants that do have the space to have their own garden space or um, rowing space. And, and, you know, then if you've got the compost, it's a great story as well for, for, for talking about it. The other thing is there's community compost networks as well, where they would take that. And I mean, you know, coffee shops have been doing this for a while with, you know, coffee grinds and things like that, but there's lots of more scalable kind of views of that with community gardens and things like that. We're winding down, so I, I do want to get to the Q&A, but I wanted to ask you uh, one more question, because I, I, I think it's one of the most relevant questions we'll tackle today, which is about ongoing education. Uh, where yeah. can people learn more about everything we've talked about today? If they're interested, they want to get started, how do they get started? So, I mean, Josh, obviously, like listening to your podcast would be a good start, you know, um, listening to um, other podcasts like the Chef's Manifesto that, you know, podcasts are a great way for you to listen to something, to get some ideas um, about different topics, hear different experts, chefs speaking in different ways. I'd say also, you know, a lot of it we get through following people on social media because a lot of storytelling is being done through different platforms now. And it's being done in bite-sized ways, which you can then actually access. So, you know, we have a Chef's Manifesto Instagram where we share stories from chefs around the world. There's lots of other chefs within there that share great content, ideas about like how to create this or how to use this ingredient or... And I know in our space, we find the chefs learn from one another as much as they, you know, like, so just learning from across cultures is also really important because when you're in a culture, you kind of are fairly aware of what's going on around you, but you're not aware of like, oh, what are they doing in Peru? And how does that, how could that be relevant in LA or what's going on in, in you know, Bangalore and, you know, or what's going on here, you know? And so I think following people, um, I also say it's ask questions. So when you go to restaurants yourself, ask people questions about stuff. You learn a lot. You learn a lot about practices. You can, you can interrogate that. A lot of chefs that are doing sustainable restaurants are really happy to take you through it because they're not doing it just for themselves. It's not, they're doing it because they, they believe it's the right thing often. And so, as you said, you know, it's still going to make sense from a business perspective, but they then were quite happy to kind of take you through it and say, hey, this is some of the stuff that we've screwed up on. Here's some stuff that we're learning. Here's some things we're, we're, we're moving forward. The other thing is, I think, reading. There's a lot of books out there at the moment around um, sustainability, around different practices that are coming out, a lot on the climate front, thinking about that. So you, you and, and I would say getting into some of that is really key. I'm just trying to think of, um, there's a there's a book I've probably got on my bookshelf somewhere here, but I'll, I'll um, but yeah, there's quite a few cool books that kind of have a look at, which just help get you into that space. Right on. Um, I, I want to take we have time for one or two questions. So if you guys want to populate the Q and A um, with any questions that you have for Paul, he's an amazing resource. I'm going to start with a question from Tiffany, who says we've been considering going to a reusable a reusable container for customers. Um, is that something that, that can be used uh, with or without having to be cleaned um, when they're brought in? How does, how does that process work? Yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I definitely think you, you've got to look at what your legal health and hygiene stuff or you'll get shut down. So, I mean, that's the starting point. There might be a requirement there that says, yes, you have to clean. Um, and so if that's the case, then there's, that's your answer, you know, like, I, I, and then it's a question of just how do you make that work? 
I've seen a couple of restaurants which have had cleaning stations. The, you know, so the, the starting point and test on this is coffee cups, you know, reusable coffee cups. And so they've actually created a, a, a clean your own cup as you come in so that there's like, we're not going to take your cup before you clean it. And so there's like, and you've got a, you know, a cup washer and a, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, creating that kind of culture in your restaurant, if you are bringing that in near your takeaway where it's like, yes, make sure you've cleaned up. People will then try and clean up before they come in. Other people won't, they will have forgotten. So it then creates that kind of ability, but you're not going to want to put food in something that's not clean. Paul, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Um, wait, ooh, I think we have one more question. How about this one from uh, Ariane? Uh, love the idea of featuring a name on the back of the house workers on the back of the menu. Great way to improve the theme. You said a phrase. Can you repeat it? It's not just a plate. Ariana, was that for me or for Paul? <laughs> I don't, if it was for me, I never remember what I say because I speak so quickly. Um, I, I mean, you know, what we did, and it was Chef Sammy's initiative more than it was mine. I would love to take credit since he's not here, but what if he sees the recording, right, Paul? So, <laughs> um, you know, what, what, what Chef Sammy did with the menu was it, it wasn't about the plate. It was about the people and the processes that got us, that got the plate to the table. And, and that, that's really what it was about for us, was showing people that this isn't, this isn't about a product. It's about everything that went into the creation of the product because uh, pricing is, is a sensitive subject. And what we found ultimately was when people saw why the price was what it was, there was a lot more value added there. And again, I, I think it, it's really easy to dismiss a price on a piece of paper, but it's really difficult to dismiss someone's name, especially when that name is associated with someone that is six feet away from where you're dining. Yeah, no, it's well, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. I learned so much. I encourage everyone to check out uh, the Chef's Collaborative website, the Chef Manifesto, and everything that we discussed today. Um, Steven and the team over at Yelp for Restaurants will be sending out a follow-up email with links to everything that we discussed today. Um, Paul, you're the absolute best. Thank you for trying to save the world, brother. Thank you. Really appreciate the time. Good to see yep. you, Josh. Bye. You as well.